Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So, uh, <clears throat> welcome to the new lecture again uh, of, of the course fundamentals and application to electric ceramics. So, let us just briefly recap the last lecture. So, in the last lecture we completed our discussion on uh, domains in ferroelectric materials and we saw how they uh, how the domains evolve during ferroelectric switching uh, going from uh, going from zero polarization to very high saturation polarization then re reverting the switch uh, field back to zero brings us back to the state of uh, remnant polarization where there is unequal uh, uh, there are unequal volume fractions of do up domain with respect to down domain so vice versa depending upon minus pr or plus pr and then how you have to again apply a uh, uh, electric field, extra electric field to force the system back to zero polarization state which is the coercive field. So, domains are very important and their size is very important. So, factors which play important role are domain size, switching kinetics etcetera which are out of purview of this course, but these are very important factors and domains are affected by for example, things like grain boundaries. how domain switch is a function of grain size in the system, it is also a function of defects in the system, defects and impurities and so on and so forth. Okay. So, this is a, a topic of uh, basically this is a topic which is, uh, frequently is faced by researchers working in the area which, which whose aim is to synthesize good ferroelectric materials and then we look at looked at some common examples. And common examples as we saw were uh, things like lead titanate, barium titanate, you can have PBZRO3, solu solid solution of PBZR and TI which is the most common ferroelectric PBTIO3, then we have uh, BIFEO3, we have solid solution of BIFEO3 and PBTIO3 and so on and so forth and of course, we have polymeric material which is PVDF and its copolymers. Okay. So, there are quite a few examples of ferroelectric materials. Of course, PZT is the benchmark material because of its high piezoelectric coefficient, but uh, other materials are also equally interesting as well as useful. So, let us just look at the phase diagram of PVZRTIO3. So, the phase diagram of PBZR TiO3 is something like this. So, let us say you start from PBZR TiO3 on this ZRO3 on this side and then we go to PBTiO3 on this side. So, obviously, the TC is high on this side, TC is lower on this side. So, if you plot a line between the TC, it goes something like this. So, this is sort of a phase boundary at lower values it sort of has a phase boundary again. So, these are various regions which go in this material. Now, it as it turns out at higher temperatures the material is in cubic that is in paraelectric form. At lower temperatures PBTiO3 rich compositions have tetragonal structure. And this boundary which is here is called as morphotropic phase boundary at which which is a basically sharp boundary between tetragonal region and the adjoining region which is rhombohedral uh, hedral region. This boundary separates the two and basically this is a region in which these phases sort of we can say coexist. So, within the vicinity of this region, this boundary, 
So, within uh, you can say the vicinity of this bound this boundary uh, M P B both tetragonal and rhombohedral phases coexist and this coexistence of two phases basically increases the number of polarization vectors you can have material because in polar in tetragonal you can have this vector or this vector whereas in rhombohedral you can have uh, vectors along 1 1 1 direction right so you can have pr vector in this direction this direction this direction this direction this direction and this direction as well as this and that so in this case you will have 1 1 1 pr vectors and in this case you will have 0 0 1 as pr vector so when both of these coexist number of polarization vectors are larger as a result it leads to easier switching and higher higher d33 so this gives rise to higher d33 and this is at a composition of 47 53 nearly 47 percent pbzr tio3 and 53 percent pbtio3 okay so pbzro3 of 57 47 and 53 of pbti somewhere at the corner at low uh, pbtio3 concentrations the material is anti ferroelectric so pure pure PVZR TiO3 is anti ferroelectric. So, anti ferroelectric material we have not discussed, but basically it shows loop like this, something like this. So, it has some sort of uh, hysteresis. Uh, so, this is 0 electric field, this is E, this is P. So, in the first and third quadrant, it shows some sort of a hysteresis, but at 0 electric field, it has 0 polarization, just like uh, anti ferromagnet. So, at 0 magnetic field, uh, anti ferromagnet has 0 magnetization, here also at 0 uh, electric field you have 0 polarization, but when you mix it with PVTiO3, you give you achieve some interesting qualities. So, this is 490 degree centigrade, this is 230 degree centigrade or so. So, this would be approximately the mathematical sum of 2 approximately speaking. So, it is a fairly straight line it although it is a little bit non-linear, but approximately it just goes by the rule of mixtures. So, on the left you have anti ferroelectric region which is generally not very useful for most applications, but the useful application useful compositions are these uh, rhombohedral and tetragonal and the most useful of them is this MPV composition of nearly 50 50 you can say a 47 53. So, in the vicinity of MPV people make piezoelectrics which have D 3 3 values exceeding 1000 or in fact even uh, very high values have been reported. So, this is uh, one material that, that, that is there in as a ferroelectric which is very useful and similar MPBs are shown in uh, you can say similar MPB effects are seen in systems like BIFEO3, PBTIO3, BIFEO3, BATIO3 and so on and so forth. Quite a few systems show this MPB and this MPB is quite exploited phenomena for exaggeration of properties in the vicinity of MPB. So, these are, uh, so this is sort of an example of a good ferroelectric material. Okay. Now, let us see for example, what happens in case of barium titanate. Let us barium titanate is a very famous material. So, barium titanate when it is when you measure its dielectric constant, the dielectric constant of barium titanate as a function of temperature, it shows three sort of you can say kinks. Okay. So, the kinks are something like this. So, you start measuring the dielectric constant, it goes something like that, then it goes boom up, then again sort of shows behavior like this then again and then again it shows and these three temperatures are and, and this there is a hysteresis as well. So, when you take it back in the opposite direction, so this is in the forward direction, this is in the reverse direction and again this is in the forward direction and this is in the reverse direction. So, how you measure the make the measurement it is like this okay, something like that. 
Okay. So, this so there is a hysteresis in T c, but this happens at about minus 90 degree centigrade and this happens at about 5 degree centigrade and this happens at about 120 degree centigrade and the crystal structure goes from rhombohedral to orthorhombic to ferroelectric uh, to to tetragonal sorry tetragonal to cubic so this is the paraelectric state this is the high temperature paraelectric state at above 120 degree centigrade but below 120 degree centigrade it has two more transitions and they are from one ferroelectric state to another so this is also ferroelectric this is also ferroelectric and this is also ferroelectric it's just that the electric constant changes so in the tetragonal state we achieve highest electric constant whereas in orthorhombic uh, and rhombohedral regions we observe lower dielectric constant of course the temperature is also lower so polarization of that of the lattice is also lower and uh, as you you can also plot dielectric constant when you plot the dielectric constant similarly you can also plot the lattice parameter so in this case you will observe two lattice parameters in the orthorhombic case you will observe uh, three lattice parameters a b and c whereas in case of rhombohedral you will observe only one lattice parameter so you can also plot across these temperatures if you plot lattice parameters a b and c as a function of temperatures you will see this kind of uh, changes so rhombohedral will show something like this and then uh, depending upon whether you heat or cool um, so you will have basically three lattice parameters here so a b c and then in this region you will have a and c and then again you will have cubic somewhere here so this this is the tc region so this is the tc region you will have so here you will have rhombohedral you will have only one lattice parameter here you will have three of them uh, orthorhombic so you will have let's say a b and c and then here you will have uh, c and a so this is tetragonal and then we have cubic only a so one can also measure lattice constants as a function of temperature using techniques like x-ray diffraction and one can see this variation uh, in reality in these materials and the, the polarization vectors are also different in cubic you have no polarization here you have polarization along 0 0 1 okay in the other case you will have polarization uh, parallel to uh, 1 1 0 axis in the orthorhombic case so you will have so when you say p 0 0 1 you will have two directions right you can have 0 0 1 or 0 0 bar 1 in the 1 1 0 case you can have 12 directions right in case of p parallel to 1 1 1 you can have 8 directions so this is how the polar vectors will also change as you change the uh, material and generally in the in the tetragonal form the way it happens is that in tetragonal form when you convert this to tetragonal phase from cubic phase so you will see the structure will show some sort of distortion so these are all oxygen atoms sitting at the center of faces this is barium atom so this is barium this is oxygen in between we will have a tiny uh, so this is the center of the lattice your titanium atom will either be here or it will be here so this is let us say uh, center of the unit cell the titanium will be shifted up or down and the magnitude of displacement is about uh, if you draw the cross section the displacement is of the order of about you can say a few picometers so the displacement of center 
displacement is of the order of let me see the number it is about it is about 11 picometer 11 picometer. So, you can calculate the dipole moment. So, dipole moment will be q dot d q is 4 electrons 4 into 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 and d is 11 picometer. So, you can calculate the dipole moment accordingly you can calculate the dipole moment per unit volume which will give you the polarization. So, sort of you can get an estimate of polarization by just measuring the dipole moment in this fashion. So, this is about P B uh, T I O 3 and some examples of ferroelectric materials. Remember all these ferroelectric materials are also piezoelectric and pyroelectric in nature. So, you will see that many piezoelectrics and pyroelectrics which are used in practice they are actually ferroelectrics ok. Just because materials like P B T I O 3 and solid solution of P B T I O 3 with P B Z R O 3 they have high D 3 3 values in the vicinity of M P B that is why they are used as uh, uh, piezoelectric materials as well as pyroelectric materials. So, now let us look at some of the applications of ok. So, we first see how do you measure the uh, ferroelectric polarization. Ferroelectric polarization is generally measured using So, ferroelectric polarization is generally measured using a circuit called as Sayer Tower circuit ok. So, what you have in this circuit is basically is it is a very simple circuit it is not a very difficult circuit. So, you have a circuit like this let me let me just draw this first and then explain it. So, So, what you have is you have a oscilloscoter oscilloscope on which you read the polarization. So, you can have x and y. So, this is basically you can say is a you need an oscilloscope. Nowadays you can get rid of oscilloscope you have electronic circuits and computers. So, you do not need that you can just be connected to computers. You need a signal generator so that you can provide a AC field. So, this is signal generator. So, which means you must have range of voltages and range of frequencies. Generally the frequencies that we measure use for ferroelectrics are somewhere between you know uh, you know 0.1 hertz to you can go up to few megahertz ok and the voltages will depend upon the thickness of the sample, but voltages may also vary from you know 0.1 volt to few kilo volts ok they may not be available on single unit. So, you may you may have a unit up to 200 volt. So, 0 to 200 volt plus you can have something which is up to 10 kV ok. So, if you have a sample of let us say thickness uh, 1 millimeter or let us say half a millimeter 0 0.5 millimeter. So, 10 kV will give you a field. So, 10 kV divided by 0.05 centimeter. So, this is in kV per centimeter. So, this will give you very large field ok. So, so you can see you can do the calculations yourself and uh, we will we'll have uh, fields in the order of mega volts per centimeter. So, which is large enough field to so switch any ferroelectric. So, if you have a 10 kilo volt power supply with frequencies varying from 0.1 to few megahertz and generally we make the measurements at about 100 hertz to 10,000 hertz ok. This is a general range for making measurements, but it depends upon the material and just application. So, one should be able to measure most ferroelectrics if you have this system. Now, what happens in this circuit is basically you apply the signal to a ferroelectric. So, this is a ferroelectric under test. This ferroelectric is connected in series to a in parallel to a uh, your uh, reference capacitor. You must always have a reference because you are measuring the charge or polarization as a result you have to have a reference otherwise 
you you need something to calibrate the system and this reference is arched so basically you can see the circuit is very simple you have a reference capacitor and you have a ferroelectric which you measure in comparison to this reference you have a signal generator which is to uh, generate the kind of voltages that you you would like to uh, apply on the sample then then you have a oscilloscope oscilloscope is nowadays replaced by computer and software so it's it's much more easier to make the measurements the kind of measurements you may make on ferroelectrics are kind of measurements we make are you can make dc measurements so dc measurement is just for measuring the dc conductivity okay okay just the ohmic uh, losses but most of the measurements that you make are ac measurements that is time dependent measurements so time dependent measurements could be your polarization hysteresis loop measurement okay you can make dielectric measurements so this is dc conductivity is basically you can say it's a uh, it's a it's a iv measurement okay so you can measure ampere so you can measure either i or j j is the current density as a function of electric field so current versus voltage or current density versus electric field make sure that you know whether it's current or current density if you want to have current density then you need to have the measurement of electrode area accurately so generally how you make this measurement is you have this capacitor sample on that we make these electrodes electrodes are typically metallic electrodes made of silver or gold or platinum you have to choose a metal which does not inject charges you have to have a non injecting uh, and you should have a ohmic contact you should not have a, you should not have a short key contact so generally the choice of metal is silver or gold or platinum you must try and make a electrode which makes a good contact if you don't have a good contact you are going to have defects at the interface and this is going to lead to very poor measurements so generally we prefer the contacts which are evaporated contacts and after evaporation or spin uh, or printing you will have to anneal them to make a better contact annealing can be done at a little lower temperature but thermal treatment may often be necessary so you have a ferroelectric which is sandwiched between these two electrodes in order to calculate the current density or the charge density you must know the size of this electrode size of this electrode especially basically the diameter of the electrode is very important for the calculation of any quantity in terms of per unit area so polarization will be micro coulomb per centimeter square you know you need to know the electrode and electric field which is kv per centimeter and this requires you to note the thickness of sample very carefully so what you require is electrode size and thickness of of sample so dc conductivity measurement will tell you whether your sample is conducting or not if it is conducting it is probably not worth making any other measurement you just have to make a better, better sample because ferroelectrics are supposed to be insulating so general guideline is if your current density is less than if j is less than 10 to the power -6 uh, amps per centimeter square uh, sorry then it's a good material but if it is more than 10 to the power -6 amps per centimeter square then it's a pretty bad material it's a leaky material as we say it so this is sort of a general value i mean it varies from material to material but sort of a range you make a ferroelectric hysteresis loop ferroelectric hysteresis loop in the literature you will see people report hysteresis loops of various kinds you will see people measuring this kind of hysteresis loop people measuring hysteresis loop of this kind people measuring hysteresis loop of uh, this kind this is a reasonably good hysteresis loop you must have a saturation and a non linear region these ferroelectrics are bad hysteresis loops and most likely these materials are not ferroelectric they are leaky dielectrics basically they have a lot of electrical leakage in them there is a nice paper by professor jim scott on journal of physics c 
uh, which says that ferroelectric goes banana. go bananas. Uh, you can search it this paper, it shows that even if you make a measurement on a banana, you will get a loop. So, it is important to differentiate between a good loop, a proper ferroelectric loop and a, uh, and a non ferroelectric loop. So, any, any measurement which shows a rounding of hysteresis loop tip, wherever you have lot of rounding at the tip or a very bloated kind of ferroelectric loop that is probably not a ferroelectric it is a it may be ferroelectric at lower temperatures but certainly there are a lot there is a lot of leakage in the material which doesn't give you the intrinsic ferroelectric character intrinsic ferroelectric character must always result in this kind of uh, loop you must have a saturation and this is what we are striving for this is what we want we don't want the red ones and these black ones these, these are not good loops and uh, so, as a result, there is a need to make, if you get these kind of loops, there is a necessity of making temperature dependent measurements. Because at lower temperatures, the ohmic uh, contributions will become lower, as a result, you might get saturation at lower temperatures. So, temperature de dependent measurements are the key. Then also dielectric constants, for a, for a good ferroelectric, the dielectric constant you should measure should show a behavior like this okay low frequency will have some interfacial polarization but in the middle frequency range you should have a pretty flat region a lot so this is a good dielectric measurement where you don't have uh, where between the relaxation regions dielectric constant is frequency sort of independent or sort of a poor quality of material would be like this something like this so your dielectric constant varies as a function of frequency now, this is this poses a lot of challenges in terms of measuring the true dielectric constant, which means because your dielectric constant is varying as a function of frequency, which means there are other factors which are contributing to dielectric constant, and those other factors could be defects. Generally, defects arising from grain boundaries or oxygen vacancies or point defects, they contribute to dielectric constant themselves, polarization. As a result, you have frequency dependence, and that is where you need to do what we call as uh, you need to do impedance analysis. impedance spectroscopy to ensure the distinction between resistive and capacitive components, the ohmic component, non ohmic components and you need to model the ferroelectrics on the basis dielectrics and ferroelectrics appropriately, so that you can get the real capacitance and from that you can estimate what is the real dielectric constant. You cannot calculate the dielectric constant from this measurement, you have to do the impedance spectroscopy to separate out the resistive and capacitive contributions to calculate the real dielectric constant. If, if anybody does, it, does that in the literature, it is purely wrong measurement, it is not a, it's not a right way to report the data. And then you can also do AC uh, leakage measurements, so frequency dependent IV measurements or JE measurements. And then also people do I versus T measurements or P versus uh, T measurements uh, that is time dependent stability of polarization and current. These are also very important measurements for various applications where for a ferroelectric you should not see a decay in the polarization as a function of time. If you have a memory for example, the memory should not lose its charge as a function of time. right? So, that is where we meet we make these time dependent measurements. And finally, if you are making memory, then we what we call as what we make is a fatigue measurements, where you switch the ferroelectric for more than. So, if you apply pulse once, it's one cycle. But if you do it for millions and billions of cycle, it becomes fatigue measurements. And that is what you should do for ferroelectrics, which piezoelectrics or ferroelectrics, which are going to be used for multiple times in various applications. So, these are the various, I mean they are just few measurements, the basic measurements you need to ensure that your electrode is of correct type, generally a material with high work function, uh, silver, gold or platinum, better if you evaporate it, but even if you put it in terms of liquid, you must dry it quickly, make sure that it does not percolate through the sample and make sure that you measure its dimensions correctly and that is why use of masks is very important and make, make sure sample thickness is uniform, otherwise electric fields are not going to be uniform as well as your uh, sample dimensions are noted correctly. You can make DC measurements of leakage, you 
can make AC measurements of leakage, you can make P ferroelectric measurement, electric measurements as well as impedance measurements, time as well as temperature dependent and make sure when you are a ferroelectric, when you are doing a ferroelectric work, your hysteresis loop should be like this, not like the one which are shown uh, in, sorry, not like the ones which are shown in black and red, they are not good ferroelectrics. Okay, so, we will stop here today and in the next class, we will look at the applications of ferroelectrics, piezoelectrics and pyroelectrics before we finish this course. Thank you.